Uh, my name is Jim Wallert. I'm the, one of the founders and the co-executive director of Epic Theatre Ensemble in New York City. Uh, I am uh, very pleased to uh, be presenting some work from Epic Next, our, our youth ensemble. Uh, Epic's mission is to create bold new work with and for diverse communities with the goal of inspiring civic dialogue and social change. Uh, we create that work in a lot of different contexts, sometimes in fully professional contexts at our home in, on 42nd Street in Manhattan. Uh, but very frequently we create this work with educational partners in New York City public schools. Uh, sometimes we make that work with our high school partners in in-school residencies where we reach every student in every grade for four years uh, in their English, history, and science classrooms. Uh, sometimes that work is with self-selected students in an after-school program. Uh, and sometimes uh, students select to be a part of our youth ensemble, Epic Next. Uh, every summer, the members, the student uh, actors, writers, and researchers of Epic Next are commissioned by a partner organization to create uh, an original touring play around some aspect of education policy or pedagogy. Uh, this, uh, some of our previous touring shows have been about educational inequity, uh, segregation, uh, and uh, STEM pedagogy and the impact that that teaching is having on young people of color going into the workforce in science, technology, and engineering fields. Uh, this past summer, they were commissioned by Amy Stewart Wells at Teachers College in Columbia uh, to create a piece on standardized testing and assessment. So, yeah. Um, so, the students uh, began their research uh, through an interview process where they interviewed 38 different education stakeholders. Uh, students, parents, teachers, administrators, uh, a deputy chancellor of New York City Public Schools. Uh, they then uh, audio recorded those interviews and that text was woven together with their original writing uh, to create the performance text of the play that you're gonna see here tonight, which is titled Overdrive. Uh, the students were really, uh, they, they essentially formed the essential question of what, uh, are we truly valuing what we measure and measuring what we truly value? Uh, they, and they created this piece called Overdrive, which has been touring since the summer uh, all throughout New York City, uh, the Northeast, and we're gonna continue touring uh, all over the country and internationally. Uh, if anyone is interested in uh, potentially bringing one of these touring uh, places to uh, your community, uh, you can reach out to us through our website at epictheaterensemble.org. Uh, we would really uh, love to continue this conversation uh, all across the nation. So, uh, without further ado, it is my great pleasure to present the Canadian premiere of <laughs> Overdrive. I'm Lizette. Hey, I'm Haley. And I'm Christina, and this is Epic Next! Woo! This is Professor Diaz, a psychometrician. She's no one important. <laughs> <laughs> uh, hello, it's so nice to meet you all. Today we'll be performing a show in front of you all. And we just need to give you a small test just to see if we meet the qualifications as a good audience. That'll determine what kind of show we do for you. <laughs> the National Audience Assessment Board has come up with a set of questions to scrutinize how well the human brain can process information in time fashion. In return, we ask prior to entertaining you is that you yourselves participate by answering these set of questions. None of your answers will be recorded. This is for us to measure how might we best serve you. Please make sure you raise your hand if you know the right answer. Questions? Nobody? All right, let's begin. Question one. Where was His Holiness the 14th Dalai Lama born? Nobody. Uh, sorry, time's up. The correct answer is Tasker, China. Again, guys, remember, she's no one important. <laughs> Question two. How many chakras are there? Uh, wrong. There are 
114. <laughs> Remember, guys, she's no one important. Question three. You're a bus driver. And the bus starts out empty. At the first stop, three people get on. At the second stop, eight people get on and four people get off. At the third stop, two people get on and four get off. The question is, what color are the bus driver's eyes? <laughs> Over there. Huh? What you said? Hazel? <laughs> what color are your eyes? Huh? Uh, eh. Wrong. Uh, wrong. 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 Slow. <laughs> She's no, no one important. <laughs> Question four. A random sample of 374 oh, United you. States pennies was collected, and the age of each penny was determined. According to the box plot that Professor Diaz is holding, what is the approximate range of the ages? It's a time test. <laughs> uh, sorry, time's up. Final question. What is the circumference of Timmy's belt? Timmy, you know, he Timmy, wears you a wear belt, a belt, you know. It's a nice belt. Anyone? It is a test I cannot help you. Uh, sorry, time's up. Don't worry. You can always take it again. You did great, really. <laughs> Entire test. <laughs> uh, last night's audience did a little bit better. Based on the Jonathan Clemming strategy of standardized audience assessment from the studies originally published by Harvard University, you have scored a 27 out of 80. Ooh. Ooh. <sighs> She's no one important. Albert Einstein said, everybody, everybody is a genius. But if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, it'll live its whole life believing that it is stupid. We're taking a test, 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 we're I can't focus. It's as if my eyes try to be unblurred from the scattered letters in front of me, and, and my brain tries to hit the control button to transform like yours. I think I'm ready. No, I know I'm ready. With the resources I've been given, I know I'm gonna pass this test. I mean, I'm smart enough. Dad always said I was smart enough. Mom is gonna want me to do this, right? What if I don't understand? What if I don't know, miss? I want my mama, she can help me. She can? I have to take the test all by myself? Like a big girl. For what I gotta take this stupid judgmental test? Like I already know I'm a fail. Like I'm just another spick from the Bronx. Well, that's what they wanna call me. I feel like this test is useless. Walking into class makes me have anxiety and I haven't even seen the test yet. Why is my booklet in the front? Shit, it feels like everyone's staring at me. I feel so exposed. Why do they create these tests that cause so much harm? These kids are so hurt, so shaky. Stop worrying, Angie. Just take the test, but the test is what makes you the best, but it's like playing Russian roulette. The trigger is the bubble. Your finger is the pencil. Now if I pull the trigger, will it make me fail? These tests are very narrow in the terms of the way students think. And it only rewards students that are very good at that reductive way of thinking, always picking that one right answer all the time. And some of you might say, sure, but some of these tests might be more valuable in some content areas or certain, some knowledge, like say math. But the problem, is with these policies, these federal policies like No Child Left Behind. No Child Left Behind had a lot of appeal to minority folks because we could finally hold the system accountable. It didn't take me long, though, to realize that it was a false indicator. We've put so much emphasis on measures alone, right? So if you think about it, like, if you want to define what's a good school, that's often code for a school that has high test scores. If you want to define What's a good student? That's often code for a student that has high test scores. The issue is not racial myths. 
The issue is quality education. We even use racial myths in pursuit of an education of higher quality. To simply mix students by race does not ensure high quality education. So if we're valuing these schools and their students and their teachers by these measures, we have to ask what are we missing? What are we not valuing? And what are the consequences of that? We measure what we value, what some people value, right? And then we value what we've measured. I loved the idea when it first cropped up, but then I began to regret having supported it. And that's when the cycle becomes dangerous. dangerous. Hey, miss, I heard I failed the Global Regents, and I wanted to speak to you about how this could affect my graduation. It won't really affect your graduation. It's just a little thorn by your side that you need to get rid of. Like we always say, education is the passport to the future. <laughs> okay, I know, but what if I fail again? What will happen then? I'm sure that won't happen. You're a really intelligent kid. I'm sure the second time will be the best because your future, 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 future. future. your future is bright. Okay, but does my future really depend on this test? Because the more I take it, the more I don't understand. Like, if you never try, you'll always fail. And it will never matter, so try again. Try again, fail again, but fail better. You giving me an IEP isn't gonna change anything. Well, with this IEP, it'll give you more time to focus. You won't have to rush to the test. Testing is a skill. While this may come as a surprise to some, it is a simple fact. Simple fact. What is a fact? Me having a different mindset from everybody Not else? Not intentionally, I just feel like with this, you can catch up with everyone and graduate with your fellow comrades. Because, because education, education is a passport to the, to the future. future. I get it. We all do. You want me and my fellow comrades to be the same, but we're not. You put us in this category, but we're not just letters in the alphabets that you could pick and choose from. You put us in a classroom where we're all taught the same. But what makes you think that the same knowledge is what's going to make us gain? Don't you understand that we're different? We all are. You can't make us take one test on one day to define one kid. It will gain you the ability to move on in the real world because education is a passport to the future. No, the test is what helps you. It's what gets you out to college. Everyone has different test scores. I mean, it's just a test. Because education, education is a passport, passport to the future. You just want us to be the same. Future. Test. Future. Same. Future. Test. Future. Same brain. These tests aren't realistic. Miss? You'll never have to take a test like this when you get a job or anywhere else in the real world. How many jobs demand employees to come up with the right answer from memory while the clock is ticking? How often are we forbidden to ask coworkers for help or to depend on a larger organization for support? And when someone is judging the quality of your work, whether you are a sculptor or a lifeguard, well, financial analyst, how common is it for you to be given a secret pencil and paper exam? Jose. We never had the resources, so I don't think I'm in the wrong to complain when they've given us a test to lose and not gain. I thought these tests were supposed to test our progress, but it's not. It's whoever has the highest grade. They cost more. They'll go somewhere in life. I feel bad for the students in other schools that have extra time. I mean, aren't they called special ed? They could pass the test if they wanted to. Maybe. Stop worrying, Angie. Just take the test. OK, OK, I'll try. Question one, how many quarts are in a gallon? A, four, B, two, C, six, D, one. I don't know, miss. Can you help me? Oh, wait, I have to take the test like a big girl. But miss, my stomach hurts. Can I go to the nurse? But why not? Because I have to take the test or mommy might get mad at me. Or, or mommy, mommy might get mad at me. me. Or, or mommy, mommy might get mad at me. me. I just want to curl up into a little ball, but I can't. My leg shakes to so the seconds counting. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. This teacher's pissing me off. Can you sit down? Or go somewhere, because you walking around looking at my paper is making me nervous, making me feel like I'm a fail. 
But I know I'm going to fail. Low downs like me either become homeless or a dope addict. Maybe a drug dealer. How can y'all think so little of me? Of us? But I get it. It's cool. It's okay. Y'all think I'm shit. Yo, teacher! I ain't taking this stupid ass test for the fourth time. Jose, 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 Jose. There must have been an issue with the last time he took the test. You did everything right. We're gonna get to the bottom of this. There shouldn't be an issue with your test. We understand how you're feeling, but we just need you to No! Down. You don't understand. I'm tired of everyone throwing their I understand cards in my face. Mm -hmm. My life is on the line here. What's the matter with you all? You prepared me to pass a test and you guys seem to only understand that I'm supposed to go with the flow because I need my diploma. If I can't be real in the real world, then what's the point of school? What's the point of all this testing, quizzing, and grading if I'm not developing? I'm not good in school. I'm not good in the real world. So what the hell is the purpose of school anyways? The, the purpose, purpose of school. Of school. The, the purpose, purpose of school. school. The purpose of school. The purpose of school is, um, you know, it's uh, learning. It's giving students grow. the opportunity to grow. Empower students, empower children. To learn responsibility, to be trustworthy. School is a career as a young kid. Exposing students to a realm of different ideas and possibilities. To educate the hearts and minds of students and adults engaged in the teaching process. Students are aren't being seen, seen as whole human beings. beings. Schools currently are run as a way of Warehousing troubles some members of society. But if we were to think about the ideal, I think. School ought, ought to be about, about the development of the creative, creative intellect. The purpose of schooling is a social control thing. The purpose of education is sort of the opposite of that. It's, it's freedom. freedom. <clears throat> uh, uh, uh. You need to stop, break, and breathe. You have a lot in you. Even if you don't feel it or see it, there is something special about you. Now, I see the frustration with you kids in these tests, and I say, what in the world is wrong here? Students come in here early in the morning already with the impression that he or she is failing. But you need to look in a different direction. Get your head out of your behind. No, 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 no. You don't get it, man. You see, during, during the test, I am, pe people call it, I'm, I'm special ed. I don't process some things on the test like other people do. And having the same tests, extra hours, extra time, it just isn't enough for me. Your situation isn't isolated. You're not unique. It's not peculiar to you. Don't make a decision out of anger and do something that you'll regret. Now, I'm not saying that testing is perfect, but testing could be used to cultivate to develop our abilities and inform the process rather than tell you how good, how well you've done. Boy, if you walk out of this school, the last thing you'll be getting is any intellect at all. You have a future. Shape it wisely. You see, outside we are students, but inside we are patients. They all think we're sick, giving tests as medication. Isn't school where you're supposed to learn, but you walk in the room and you're already a subject. You're told at an early age that these tests are critical to your disposition. And if you try to speak out, you're an imposition. And so taking the test becomes your only mission. The teachers are supposed to act as the nurses, but they don't even think that this medicine is working. There's nothing about this that guarantees integrity, but I'm trapped because I'm supposed to have clarity, be a role model for these young people that stare at me, and how would it look if I don't follow the rules? And when you don't stand up and sit in silence, you make us all fools, you normalize it. And what you're forgetting is that to us, it feels like violence. We need to escape from these hospital beds, got all these words in my head, cause they got me on these meds. But who's at the door demanding we need more? It's the principals. 
They make promises to soothe us. Band-aids for bullet holes. It's all in your head. You'll be all right. Just go back to bed. And you're back at your desk taking another test. The parents want a voice walking around like they got no choice, dragging their opinions like zombies. I'm aware of the situation. I never had a chance to have a good education. I just, I just want, want the, the best, best for my child. child. I feel like I can't say anything. If a doctor says my child has a tumor, I'm not going to question it. So if a teacher says my child needs tutoring, I'm gonna make the best of it. I understand I'm pushing Cindy to that stream. The test may be unfair, but I still want my kid to dream. I just, I just want, want the best for my child. They say your child needs PM school. Uh, she needs to be pushed. Your child needs an IEP. <laughs> she needs to be rushed. Your child needs medicine. Your child needs medicine. They know what's best. They went to school for that. They know the rules for that, so yeah, I'm cool with that. That's the game, it's never gonna change. You have to deal with that. If my child needs this to succeed, I'm not gonna question it. If my child needs this to survive, I'm going to make the best of it. I understand she might hate me right now, but I hope she sees that in the end, I did this for her. Cause I don't want her to end up like me. If I were to go up against, the government might make me get on my knees and repent. I, I just want, want the, the best, best for my child. child. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then you have these elected mm -hmm. officials. When you tell them about the situation, all they go to preaching about is accountability. How are you supposed to deal with me if all I hear from you is accountability? That's all they have to say. We talk about this all day, and all you hear from them is accountability. It's as if that's the excuse that they use as a suture, but they're the bad doctors. These meds only work 20% of the time, and we think that's fine. Let those 80% be ill. They'll be all right. We'll give them more meds tonight. And then it doesn't work again, and all you'll hear from them is accountability. Prescribing us meds and trying to make us all have the same mindset. Well, what happens? if it doesn't work for the rest. Are we still not good? Still not going to be the best? Trained medicated soldiers are measured at the top of these doctors' folders. They're not being mindful that they're killing these patients' cells, but they don't care. Don't you get it? As long as the medicine sells. These standardized tests aren't the best thing to assess us. They shouldn't be what makes or breaks us. It's as almost if these people hate us. These companies make these tests, but they aren't the ones who grade or survey us. They don't know you, they don't know me, they don't know what I need, because right now I need sleep, but that's what they don't see. All these people want from us is money. We're the worker bees, we gotta get these people there, honey. And when another year of testing is done, we step out into the summer sun. <sighs> but once Labor Day passes, we go back to square one. You see, outside we are students, but inside we are patients. And sometimes, when someone tells you you're sick, your whole life, it comes true. Cindy. I'm talking about you. What happens to the people that don't grade well? They're not good test takers or good working machines. The test being the battery. So are we being tested as if we're just things? Why do I have to administer this? If the government trusts me to teach them, then the government should trust me to assess them. The test is what makes us the best, especially kids who get 90s or higher like me. <laughs> I don't know, miss, I'm trying. It's just too hard. <laughs> whatever I want, like get into whatever college I want, but what happens when Kelly gets a 95 and I get a 90? What is dad gonna say? What am I gonna do? <laughs> I've been looking at the same question for the past three hours, none of which makes sense. Like, when did we even learn this? There's only three minutes left. I'll, I'll just bubble in anything. What is dad gonna say? What am I gonna do? This, this is not, not how I learn. learn. I am not a value. My dad sees me as a grade. My family is full of intellects, people who have made it to the top. While I, I have no chance of making it to the top. I'll be just like my dad. I know that's not what he wants, but dad, I'm sorry. I can't be a number in a, corrupt, in a corrupted system anymore. The suicide rate among 10 to 14 year olds doubled between 2007 and 2014. The same period of time in which states increasingly adopted new high stakes tests. In 2014, 425 middle schoolers nationwide took their own lives. Psychologists say several factors are involved, but pressure from standardized testing is high on the list. Sorry. Time's up. I done lost my student. Lost her in the depths of work 
fear, and the trigger of her father's gun. I watch kids struggle every year, every fucking year for the past 20 years. Ella está muerta, she's gone. All because of a piece of paper. A piece of paper. She was scared, so many kids were. How dare we try to define these students? I've been drinking for the past two weeks. I left my job for Christ's sake. That's how bad it's been. This isn't a joke anymore. My mother always says, if a flower blooms and it turns gray, that's when we know something is wrong. And this, this is wrong. Everybody, Everybody is, is a genius. genius. But if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, Standardized testing cannot test the idea or feeling of love. Like, when you hug your mom and she tells you you're, she's proud of you no matter what. It cannot test your acts of kindness. Ayudar a la gente. Your creativity, your passion. Like when you were eight and you got a gold star on your art project because you spent the whole week thinking of the meaning family. Your truthfulness. Like when you told your parents you were gay. Your, your pain. pain. Like the time you were told your, your test, test scores aren't, aren't good enough. enough. Your heart, soul, goodwill, curiosity, judgment. On honor. Imagination. Hopefulness. Pride. Bravery. Dignity. Qualifications. Understanding. Forgiveness. Cordura. Dreams. Friendship. Those are the things tests cannot test. They cannot test nor define. Us. Us. Please welcome to the stage Jennifer Jelson Holm and Janelle T. Scott. Good evening. Welcome to the 2019 presidential address. We hope you're having a wonderful conference so far. Are you? Are you having a wonderful conference? Yeah. Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> Jennifer and I are here to introduce our friend, AERA President, Professor Amy Stewart Wells. It has been a true privilege and an honor to have worked with her to develop the theme and the presidential program for this year's annual meeting. And we now have the pleasure of introducing her. A sociologist of education policy, Ed Amy is a leading scholar of the intersection of race, schooling, and inequality. Amy began her career as a reporter, earning a master's degree in journalism from Boston University. She covered breaking news stories for the Associated Press and wrote articles for the New York Times education page. She then earned her doctorate at Teachers College, Columbia University, working with esteemed sociologist Robert Crane on essential research on desegregation in St. Louis, Missouri. She then joined the faculty of UCLA, where she continued her work on desegregation and collaborated with Jeannie Oakes on a groundbreaking study of schools engaged in detracking. While there, she also embarked upon the first statewide study of California's charter school policy. In 2001, she returned to Teachers College, Columbia University, where she is currently a professor of sociology and education. Over the years, Amy's scholarship has pushed the field with pressing questions grounded in rigorous qualitative and mixed methods research. She has authored five books and published more than 60 articles and reports. She is a member of the National Academy of Education and American Education Research Association Fellow, and she has been a visiting fellow at the Center for Advanced Study in the Behavioral Sciences and the Russell Sage Foundation. 
She was awarded the 2016 AERA Presidential Citation for Outstanding Contributions to Educational Research and the 2000 AERA Early Career Award for Programmatic Research. She was also a Spencer Foundation Dissertation Fellow and a Spencer National Academy of Education Postdoctoral Fellow. Amy is an engaged scholar, publishing in popular outlets such as the Atlantic Monthly and Education Week and working closely with schools and the civil rights community. She has investigated issues of school choice, desegregation and resegregation, tracking and opportunity structures in racially diverse but unequal schooling systems and classrooms. As we mentioned, she was one of the first researchers to explore charter schools and to articulate the tensions between promises and outcomes particularly as they relate to equity and access. Finally, she has examined the relationship between housing policy and school segregation, and this work has helped to spark needed conversations about the narrow ways we define what counts as good schools and how these conceptions are related to race, poverty, and assessment policy, policies that reify these understandings. Amy has been committed to translating this work into practice and tangible change for schools and children. She is currently the director of the Public Good Project, a nonprofit dedicated to helping public schools tap into the educational benefits of racially diverse learning spaces through the use of qualitative research methods, public engagement, legal, legal advocacy, and strategic communication. Amy also directs Reimagining Education, a summer institute for educators in demographically diverse urban and suburban schools. As Sonia Douglas Horsford, a professor of educational leadership at Teachers College, comments, the institution has been influential in advancing conversations around the importance of racial diversity, integration, and cultural sustaining education in New York and across the country through this pedagogically rich and inclusive professional development experience. And never far from her journalism roots, Amy has worked closely with the Spencer Foundation and Columbia University Journalism Project to support and develop education reporting. But these accomplishments and contributions, as important as they are, don't tell the full story of her influence on the field. In order to understand who Amy truly is and what she means, we have to share how she has influenced her students and her mentees. She has, in her time in the academy, developed and cultivated scholars whose work extends the critical questions they learn to ask, to refine, and to do research to answer under her expert mentorship. As for us, Amy's teaching and mentorship changed our lives. We learned from her how to be rigorous scholars. We worked with her on several large qualitative studies in which she included us as peers, as equals, trusting and validating our contributions to theory and research design, and insisting that we share authorship on grants and publications. We learned how to conduct comprehensive interviews, to always leave the recorder on until saying the final goodbyes, because in those closing moments are often when informants share the most powerful and important insights. But the story of Amy's influence extends far beyond us. We reached out to former students and mentees and asked us to help us, asked them to help us um, share some of their Amy stories. Many of them are here today. Can you stand if you're a current or former mentee or student of Amy Stewart Wells? The two of us met Amy over 20 years ago when we were about 10 years old. <laughs> From the day we entered graduate school, she showed a deep and abi abiding faith in our abilities, even when we doubted our own capacity. For many graduate students, academia can often be a decentering experience. And we, like many others, often had ambivalence about whether or how we fit into higher education. Amy made us feel as though our ideas and insights were valuable and that our scholarship was important. This has been the experience for so many of Amy's advisees and mentees. As Allison Rhoda, now an assistant professor at the Molloy College of Education said, Amy brings students into her world, teaches them everything she knows, and treats them as equals. Similarly, Maya Warner, now a senior researcher at SRI, shares, she created a safe space for intellectual growth where I never felt uncomfortable or afraid to share my opinion. Amy taught me to stand in my power. Amy modeled for us how to 
pursue careful and robust research that centered issues of race and power, Camille Wilson, professor at the University of Michigan shared, her critical sociological, methodological, and policy orientations have profoundly influenced me, as well as her integrity, dedication, and heart. Amy is an educational researcher who goes about her work with excellence, commitment to social justice, and compassion while teaching her students how to do so too. And as Dr. Amanda Datt now, one of Amy's first ever doctoral advisees, now a professor at the University of California at San Diego writes, Amy's critical approach to studying policy through a rich intersection of social theory and qualitative data has profoundly shaped my work and is a model for the field. Amy always made us feel as though she had time for us in the midst of her incredibly full schedule. Bianca Baldridge, now an assistant professor at the University of Wisconsin, Madison shares, from late night and early morning phone calls to pulling into rest stops to talk about my research, Amy always found ways to make time for me and my work. She has also been dedicated to providing her students with as many opportunities as she can, from research opportunities to co-authorship on articles to shared leadership in presentations. As Diana Cordova Cobo, her current student at Teachers College said, she pushes us to center stage when many PhD students are relegated to thank yous buried in the endnotes of an article. And importantly, she uses her hard fought influence to ensure that her students' voices are heard within the academy. Terenda White, now an assistant professor at UC Boulder, reflects, Amy is a quiet giant. She's a giant, of course, because of her enormous intellectual and scholarly contributions to research and policy. But I've learned that Amy is also quiet in the sense that she strategically and stealthily makes room for people in the academy, people whose voices have been silenced or muted, people like myself, a woman of color who will forever be grateful that she made room for me to speak, to ask questions, to write, and to publish. Amy has also showed us how important it is to take time for our health and well-being, and that it was essential that we prioritize our families and ourselves. She somehow found time to fit in her swimming routine to a very busy schedule. Cynthia Grudzik, now dean at San Francisco State University, recalled, she modeled for us how to keep your fitness on even if you have to show up at meetings with wet hair and goggle marks, eating a cliff bar. <laughs> Toward that end, she treats her advisees as whole people. She celebrated our weddings, came to baby showers, made space for us to attend to family illnesses and personal challenges. From Amy, we learned that being an academic and a parent was possible. We learned it early from her example of bringing her wonderful son, Trevor, into our research group as a newborn. There, we talked theory, data, and analysis while sharing cuddling and burping responsibilities. What a wonderful model she gave us of engaged scholarship yoked to an engaged life. Amy is tenacious, brilliant, and relentlessly committed to realizing a more just society. She is a visionary. It is our distinct honor and sincere pleasure to introduce a woman we love and admire who has contributed so much to the field, to her students, to her colleagues, and to the field of public education. We give you Professor and AERA President Amy Stewart Wells. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> okay, now I'm crying. Okay, that was beautiful. Thank you, Jen and Janelle. Two extraordinary researchers with a passion for social justice and a critical lens through which they explore education policy. Their engagement as with other scholars in our field is deep and wide, and their networks are vast. And we see this in their ability to pull together this amazing program. They are funny, caring, and compassionate, and I am so grateful for their service this year and their commitment to the work and their commitment to AERA and to have more time to spend with them. Thank you, Jen and Janelle. I also want to thank Felice Levine, our executive director, who does more for this association than any of us can ever fathom. Even after working with her closely for a year, I'm still not sure of all the things she does. But I do know that her commitment to AERA and the integrity of our research is unwavering, and we owe her and her amazing staff 
a huge thank you again and again. And I have to thank Diane DeLima, whom half of you in this room have gotten an email from. She has kept me, she's worked side by side with me this year, um, keeping me sane and doing whatever I asked her to do. And I, I totally appreciate her commitment to my position as ARA president and her unwavering support. Diane, wherever you are. And to my committed partner, John, who, whose support and encouragement I appreciate every day, especially today. Thank you for being here. And I have to say hi to my son, Trevor, who, who's burping you heard of. Um, he is the light of my life. He is not here today because he's studying for a big math test tomorrow in Boston. Good luck, T. But he is live streaming, and he's very grateful I'm not conflicting with the final four. <laughs> and I have to thank my parents, Stuart P. Wells, as that's the Stuart in my Stuart, um, who in 1977 was president of his professional association, which was not education research, but windows and doors. Um, and I am a chip off the old block, and I've learned a lot from him about tenacity and integrity. And to my mother, who's no longer with us, but who was a, a elementary school teacher back in the days before there was standardized testing. She was held accountable for her work by her students' love and hugs and, and success. They called her Honey Miss Barlow. And I want to dedicate this talk to Honey Miss Barlow. This year's theme for our meeting, Leveraging Education Research in a Post-Truth Era, Multimodal Narratives to Democratize Evidence, was derived from a January 2018 consultative conversation in New York City with a group of interdisciplinary scholars whose work transcends the boundaries within AERA. This theme has generated hundreds of sessions here in Toronto, striving to connect research across disciplines, areas of studies, methodologies, epistemologies. Together, we strive to explore the meaning of post-truth within a historical context in which only certain understandings of truth have dominated and to address the propaganda of the current moment characterized by what Hannah Arendt would call extreme contempt for facts as such. Meanwhile, our research is becoming more multimodal with the growth of visual research and efforts to utilize new technologies to convey and disseminate findings. This presidential session aspires, therefore, to connect the aspects of the theme in three acts. Ah, there we go. First, you saw the epic next play, Overdrive, Based on 30 in-depth interviews, these students conducted with experts in the field of testing and measurement. They audio taped, transcribed, and coded these interviews for themes, issues, and quotes, and then wrote them up in the form of a script. So as much as we were moved by the play as a theatrical performance, extraordinary for its ability to grab our attention and help us empathize with the characters, it was also a form of performance research youth participatory action research that was transformed into a play. The second act of this presidential session is, the, is my address, The Inconvenient Truth of the New Jim Crow, in which I tap into the expertise and evidence of many AERA members to tell what I hope is a compelling story about the mismatch between the research evidence and the policies that dominate and dictate our educational system. This mismatch is a problem for all students and educators because the rules of our educational system have become toxic to learning and child development and teacher professionalism. But it is also yet another manifestation of the racial hierarchy which has dominated our society ever since it was first used to rationalize slavery and the colonization of indigenous lands. And finally, act three of this session will be a new film that we are creating called Children Left Behind, Time to Reimagine Education. This film was produced by Firelight Media Production Company, founded by award-winning documentary film producer Stanley Nelson. Firelight, working in conjunction with my research team to understand the research, has explored the dimensions of the educational system that are the pillars of the new Jim Crow. And it was produced by Lisa Bins, who's here with us tonight. 
So let's begin by grounding ourselves in the lands upon which we stand, which are the treaty lands of the Mississauga and the traditional territory of those who have walked this land in the past and present. We, the researchers of education, stand on this land above the so-called lost rivers of Tecranto. These rivers were once central to the life, culture, and knowledge of indigenous people whose relationships to these lands we honor. The rivers were central to the indigenous people's way of life and relationship with the land, as acknowledged in the Treaty of the Dish with One Spoon a treaty in which five indigenous nations agreed to share the resources of this land and work together as a democracy, as the colonists were still ruled by a monarchy. Why should we as education researchers care about these hidden waterways which we cannot see or touch? We should care because these rivers beneath Toronto serve as a metaphor for the pre precious knowledge that settlers, colonialists from Europe attempted to bury and erase. In his unforgettable poem, oops, thank you, um, The Negro Speaks of Rivers, Langston Hughes tells us that African Americans have known rivers, ancient as the world and older than the flow of human blood in vein, veins. My soul has grown deep like rivers, says Hughes, reflecting a powerful relationship between the flow of rivers and the soul of black folk, whose wisdom and knowledge perseveres this, the test of time. This relationship between wisdom and water is echoed in the words of Canadian indigenous writer Kate Cave and Cheyenne McKay. In their 2016 essay, Water Song, Indigenous Women and Water, they write, water is life and needs to be respected. For the indigenous people in Canada, there is a reciprocal and unique relationship to water. Connecting to the depth of the relationship between water, soul, language, practices, and culture, I argue that the rivers below Toronto are not lost at all. Instead, they remain powerful currents of knowledge, understanding, and resilience. They are a metaphor for all the ways of knowing and being that settler colonials here in the US and across the Americas did not understand and tried to erase. Educational institutions have been a primary tool in that erasure. The residential school system for indigenous children in both Canada and the US was based on the assumption that European civilization and Christian religions were superior to indigenous culture, which was seen as being savage and brutal. In these so-called educational settings, government officials insisted that children be discouraged and often prohibited from speaking their own language. Spiritual practices like dances and rituals were banned. And based on the Canadian Truth and Reconciliation Commission's report, the ideology that legitimized these policies and practices of the, of the Canadian indigenous reg, residential schools were borrowed from the US. In 1879, a Canadian conservative named Nicholas Davin conducted a study of the boarding schools in the US that had been established for Native Americans and recommended that the Canadian government develop a similar system. According to the TRC, Davin acknowledged that the central goal of the, of the education provided in these schools would be the destruction of the aboriginal spirituality. The TRC report also tells us that in 1883, Canada's public works minister argued that these residential schools were needed not for the purpose of teaching the indigenous students to read and write, but rather to separate them from their parents, lest they remain savages and fail to acquire the habits and tastes of civilized people. Although the terminology, terminology used to describe indigenous civilizations and culture and spiritual practices has changed, the deep-seated belief that colonial ways of knowing and being are superior has continued. Indeed, the colonial mindset that justified the claiming of land and the burial of rivers has become the lens through which government officials view education and shape education policy to this day. The attempted genocide of non-European cultures, traditions, and ways of knowing became the central goal of education. 
Rather than embracing difference, the colonial model of education excluded or punished it. And this, and this process of punishment has taken on different forms over the years and across context. Residential schools for indigenous children, the creation of the de jure segregated educational system for African American and Chicano students, and de facto racially and socioeconomically isolated schools in late 20th century urban areas. But what we, know, we, but we also know is that education can be a tool for emancipation, for reconciliation, for intellectual reparations, and for the transformation of students and society. But these things can only occur if we understand deeply the roots of our current oppressive structures, policies, and practices. In the last 30 years in the US, punishment and exclusion has taken on new forms as part of a backlash against the civil rights movement and many of the federal policies that grew out of that era. These policies include school desegregation and bilingual education, small and mostly local community-based movements to bring about more multicultural education, ethnic studies, detracking movements, and other progressive forms of education. This backlash drove the evolution of broad bipartisan support for so-called accountability in our educational system. The term accountability sounds like what we want for all of our public schools. And in the early phrase of this movement, accountability implied many things to many people, including the civil rights community that had long fought for higher quality education. Oops. Sorry about that. Um, for students of color. But had the policymakers listened to the broad and interdisciplinary knowledge of our field, accountability for the education of all children, particularly for the descendants of de jure segregated schools and residential schools, would look very different than it does now. And so we have to ask accountability for what? And accountability measured how? Since 1983, when we were told in what Berliner and Biddle called a manufactured crisis, that our nation is at risk, accountability has been measured almost exclusively by asking every student to find the same right answer to a limited number of questions on a limited number of topics. Scores on a handful of multiple choice tests is what it now means to be educated. This is the inconvenient truth of our field. Because, in fact, the evidence shows us that today's regime of high stakes standardized testing should never have become the sole or even the primary measure of what it means to be educated. Here's a brief summary of the evidence. First, a universal argument made by education researchers, including those held in high esteem in the measurement world, is that standardized tests can be helpful to measure some aspects of what students know and do not know but they have inherited limitations when it comes to measuring the broad goals of education. For instance, standardized tests have never been the best way to measure complex analytical thinking and problem solving. Furthermore, they are not helpful to teachers. According to the Gordon Commission, which was chaired by my esteemed colleague and mentor, Dr. Edmund W. Gordon, and included many of the most prominent researchers in our field, assessment of any kind should be for education and not of education. The way standardized tests are written and given and scored today, they do not have a positive effect on teaching and learning, wrote the commission. The stark contrast between formal standardized testing and informal teacher devised assessments arise because teachers need information immediately connected to what their students are working on and they interpret this evidence in light of everything else they know about their students and their instruction. As a result, standardized tests have little direct utility in the classroom. In other words, the way they are produced and administered currently, standardized tests are not being used to help students learn, but rather to punish them for not knowing what someone who does not know them decided they need to know. We also know that high stakes testing is damaging to student mental health. A review of research tells us that test-induced stress can evolve into a never-ending cycle for low-performing students. Test anxiety is a common complaint and often results in lower achievement, decreased social functioning, and lower feelings of self-worth. 
We know that standardized test drives curricular changes that not only denies the professionalism of teachers, but also crowds out many important lessons and skills that students need to participate fully in a democracy, including critical thinking, communication, and understanding different perspectives on history, literature, and, and what is valued knowledge. The negative impact of standardized assessment on the curriculum is one of the key reasons parents and teachers are engaging with the opting out movement. In a 2016 report by my colleague Oren Pitsmoni Lovey and Nancy Green Swarovski found that one third of activists take part in the movement because standardized tests force teachers to teach to the test and one fourth of activists do so because standardized tests take away too much instructional time. In addition, high stakes tests as a way to improve the system is not even working. We've been doing this for 30 years and it's supposed to lift all boats, but that turns out to be the biggest lie of all. Daniel Quartz has written that the best estimates is that test-driven accountability may produce modest gains in elementary school mathematics, but no appreciable gains in reading or high school mathematics. This is true even though reading and mathematics have been the primary focus of high stakes testing and teachers, particularly in low-income schools, spend a great deal of time on test prep. These key learnings from the research tells us that the way we are using standardized tests today hurts our children, our schools, and ultimately our democracy. And it's producing few overall gains. Tragically, the reauthorized version of No Child Left Behind, the Every Student Succeeds Act, or ESSA, which is being fully implemented at the state level this fall, continues this over-reliance on standardized tests to hold students, educators, and schools accountable. As Madhavi Chatterjee wrote this winter in a policy brief on ESSA published by the National Education Policy Center, under the new law, many educational systems will continue to make multiple demands on a single test without attention to the limitations of testing and some have proposed relying heavily on test information without sufficient evidentiary support for the validity, reliability, and utility of these exams. In the movie An Inconvenient Truth, Al Gore confronts us with our convenient reliance on non-renewable energy. Such reliance makes it more difficult for us to face the inconvenient truth about the harm that we are causing to the environment. In the same way, I am confronting our field with our own convenient reliance, namely on standardized test scores, as the central source of data in much of our research. Despite all the evidence that identify the problems related to measuring students by test scores alone, we, the researchers, are complicit in constructing a single measure-driven understanding of high achievement. How many sessions at this annual meeting feature papers that measure student outcomes and effect sizes only in terms of standardized tests? And as we are not naive about the power of big oil to influence environmental policies or lack thereof, we should not be naive about the power of the testing industry to affect our education policies. But it's not just the industry when we as researchers rely heavily on the big data of test scores on the easy to crunch numbers. We are part of the problem. <laughs> Fortunately, as with climate change, Al Gore and others tell us that the, the solution to these problems is in our hands, that we can learn and teach others to solve them. We can work together, support the movement, and push for better environmental policies the impact of Gore's message is still being realized in everything from the Green New Deal to the number of AERA members carrying our reusable water bottles. But what is our educational New Deal going to be? How do we as researchers help foster an educational system that is less reliant on incomplete measures of student learning and understanding and, what it, and is, that is more open to students' voices, experiences, and understandings? A system that is less focused on assimilation to one right or wrong way of knowing everything to a system that is more about learning, critical thinking, and exploring. 
and understanding more than one perspective. We have the research evidence that supports this change, and we can leverage the growing frustration among parents, students, and the general public about the heavy reliance on standardized tests. So we, you would think that our path to change would be clear, but what if it's more complicated than that? What if the problem in our field, like the rivers beneath Toronto, run much deeper than an assessment issue? What if the fir current form of assessment is a symptom and not a cause? What if the inconvenient truth is that testing and the way we have defined accountability is, at its core, just the latest manifestation for maintaining racial segregation and inequality? For maintaining a racialized hierarchy of valued knowledge, valued students, and valued schools within our educational system. Let me explain. I know that many of us have, have been inspired by the research and writing of Michelle Alexander. In her book, The New Jim Crow, Alexander examines the criminal justice system and how it connects to the underlying theme of white supremacy. And by stepping back and looking more holistically at the sum of the parts of the criminal justice system, she saw the connections. She saw that one component of the system, for example, underfunded legal aid, can interact with another component, for instance, the drug laws, to create a totalizing criminal justice system that is analogous to Jim Crow in terms of policies and the racial ideology that legitimates it. Alexander writes about the evolution of her thinking about the criminal justice system. How many civil, like many civil rights lawyers, she writes, I was inspired to attend law school by the civil rights victories of the 50s and 60s. Even in the face of growing social and political opposition to remedial policies such as affirmative, affirmative action, I clung to the notion that the evils of Jim Crow are behind us and that while we have a long way to go to fulfill the dream of an egalitarian multiracial democracy, we have made real progress. Quite belatedly, I came to see that mass incarceration in the US had, in fact, emerged as a stunning and comprehensive and well-disguised system of racial social control that functions in a matter strikingly similar to Jim Crow. When I began my career as an educational researcher, I studied school desegregation. And like Alexander, I believed that there was a way to fix the problem of racial segregation in US schools by increasing student access and addressing student assignment. When I studied the problem of access, however, I centered white communities and schools as good in part because the evidence showed that these were the spaces that had more resources, more qualified or at least certified teachers, more challenging curriculum, and certainly stronger networks to higher education and employment. And in part because I had been taught as a white person growing up in America that neighborhoods and schools that were predominantly white were inherently better. I had internalized this message without critiquing it. And the goal in my mind was to give more students of color access to these good schools. But when I studied the detracking movement in the 1990s, working closely with Jeannie Oakes and our team of researchers at UCLA, I saw that access to higher track classes for students of color was often thwarted by the normative and political dimensions of racial ideology, uh, ideologies that shape so many aspects of our educational system. Reading the research of Vanessa Siddle Walker, Prudence Carter, and many others, and delving deeper into the research myself, I came to rethink my white-centric view of desegregation as simply a mecha mechanism of access to something better. I came to realize that the access desegregation provided to black and Latinx students was also problematic. That students in de jure segregated schools had been supported by black educators who knew them and taught them to achieve to their highest potential, even when their schools lacked resources and facilities. And that black and Latinx students were often traumatized within predominantly white schools by the racial hierarchy that is deeply embedded in the curriculum, pedagogy, and sociocultural climate of these so-called integrated spaces. 
Examining the structural barriers, barriers that deny students of color access to well-resourced and well-connected schools is an honorable goal. And many of us have done excellent research on these issues of student assignment and patterns of segregation. Yet as I, as I discovered in the course of my research, these barriers were not simply a problem within the system, but rather reflections of its core construction. The esteemed legal scholar Lonnie Guineer has written that the social engineers in Brown versus Board of Education's preoccupation with de jure segregation disabled the plaintiff's attorneys and their liberal allies from comprehending Jim Crow as the visible manifestation of a larger, constantly mutating racialized hierarchy. That hierarchy was racialized both by elites to consolidate their power and privilege and by poor whites to palliate their own debased circumstances. How does that relate to an educational system that has been contorted by its over-reliance on standardized tests to the point that it no longer looks like education? That is the new Jim Crow of education. Just as Alexander and the documentary 13th examine the connections across the components of the criminal justice system to reveal a racialized system, I believe that we as education researchers need to connect the strands of our work to show the different aspects of education policy and practice together maintain a separate and unequal system. And while there are many interconnected pillars of the new Jim Crow of education, including unequal access to resources and qualified teachers, I suggest that we focus on the four that perpetuate the rationales for segregation and allow these inequalities to be maintained. These four interconnected pillars of the new Jim Crow of education are, number one, the test score gap, AKA the achievement gap, which is based solely on one or two standardized tests, which I've already discussed as being problematic on several levels for all students, but especially for historically minoritized students. Number two, teaching to the gap. Another practice that is targeted mostly at low-income students of color with lower test scores, dumbing down the curriculum for those students while teaching to the test and test prep in more affluent and predominantly white schools is virtually non-existent, seen as not necessary and a waste of time. Number three, punishment for low test scores, which describes the disparate impact of harsh discipline on black and brown students who have the lowest test scores. And finally, the culmination, the, te the, t the testing gap to justify segregation. In each of these areas, we see the research that education policies and the practices they are driving contrast with the evidence of the profession and the knowledge of our field. Let's look at each of these pillars in more detail through a racialized lens. The test score gap. Like the criminal justice system as described by Michelle Alexander, is not only the policies and practices that put so much weight and emphasis on standardized testing alone, but they're problematic for the educational system, the children, the teaching profession as a whole, they are particularly damaging to low-income communities of color who are constantly located at the bottom of a wide test-based achievement gap. Explanations for this so-called achievement gap have ranged over the years, from the disproven biological explanations to arguments of the so-called culture, culture of poverty. These explanations all focus on what is supposedly wrong with black and Latinx students and their schools. None of them address what is wrong with the instruments used to measure the gap. Thank you. Well, there is no doubt that poverty has a negative effect on child development and learning, and schools serving poor students often lack much needed resources. Gloria Ladson Billings has provided us with a powerful description of the historical and present day impact of unequal educational opportunities called the education debt. She explains that this debt comprises historical, economic, sociopolitical, and moral components. Ladson Billings' work enables us to see that through the cultural constructions of standardized tests, the educational debt is connected to the biases deeply embedded in the testing instruments. 
While measurement experts work to make standardized test questions valid and reliable for test takers across different backgrounds, more recent critiques of testing and the deductive reasoning it relies upon suggest that this goal is virtually impossible. That there are complex psychological and cultural reasons why the best takers test ta why the best test takers look most like the test makers. In his AERA award-winning book, Inheriting Possibility, Ezekiel Dixon Roman, <laughs> awesome book, you gotta read it, explains that multiple forms of social difference, including race, gender, and sexuality, and the extent to which they have cumulative effects on youth social and educational processes, can have a profound impact on their SAT exam experiences. Dixon Roman writes that even as the SAT test helped to shape the concept of merit, the constructs of quantitative and verbal reasoning within the test were defined based on cultural knowledge of the dominant group and institutions. He notes that the argument that test score differences are not an issue of the test, but rather of the society or the students and their families, assumes that the test is developed in a vacuum and completely unrelated to the material and discursive processes of society. The choosing of particular objects of measure is not just a cultural construct, but also a political decision in and of itself. This determination of what is meritable, writes Dixon Roman, has the consequences of excluding alternative behaviors and ways of knowing, particularly those of marginalized groups. The argument that there are cultural and experiential ways in which students interact with rigid measures of right and wrong can lead not only to low test scores for students whose behaviors and experiences are far removed from the questions asked and the answers required. It also has a deep emotional and psychological impact on students' sense of themselves and others. An example of this lies in the recent test protest against the Massachusetts graduation test that asked students to write a journal entry based on Colson Whitehead's novel, The Underground Railroad, with the perspective of a white racist person. So you can see the president of the Massachusetts Teachers Association found this extremely problematic and imposed a new layer of trauma, particularly on the students of color, forcing students to read a tiny excerpt of the book, produced a quick answer about race relations, embodying a racist perspective, and then stifle their complicated emotions that emerge. This argument of thinking about testing as, as culturally constructed is supported by the 2018 report released by the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine called How People Learn Too, Learners, Contexts, and Cultures. The report notes that culture plays an important and complex role in shaping how people learn. Cultural influences shape individuals from the beginning of life. Research and theory from diverse fields has, have contributed to an evolving understanding that all learners grow and learn in culturally embedded contexts, and this affects how they answer test questions. The importance of culture and life experience in shaping knowledge is something educational researchers and practitioners have known for a long time. Hence, the progressive education movement and the culturally responsive pedagogy movement. Unfortunately, this understanding of how students learn is not reflected in how they are assessed by a standardized test or, what, or for what we are holding our schools accountable for, particularly when these tests are high stakes. Like the rivers that were covered by the settler colonials, colonials certain forms of knowledge and experience of the world are valued by those in power more than others. Standardized tests can only reflect some knowledge Others, other ways of knowing will not be measured, they will be buried. And then we use this incomplete understanding as the sole measure of the gap. Who bears the burden of these faulty assessments and accountability policies? We know that 80% of black students in the US live in states with high stakes tests that dictate whether or not they graduate from high school versus 64% of white students. We know that the average student in America's big city public and charter school um, test students, public, public and charter schools test students most. 
In some contexts, students take more than 112 mandatory standardized tests from pre-kindergarten to the end of 12th grade, using up to 20 to 25 hours every school year for testing alone, not including teaching to the test and other forms of test prep. So black and brown students bear the, burden, bear the brunt of this policy, and this has an impact on how those with low test scores are taught which relates to the second pillar of the new Jim Crow, teaching to the gap. According to the National Academy's report, How People Learn, educators should support learners' motivation by attending to their engagement, persistence, and performance. Specifically, you motivate students by helping them set desired learning goals, as well as goals for performance that are appropriately challenging. Create learning experiences that, that, that learners value and support learners' sense of control. As I noted, this is what we in our field call good teaching. It is the bedrock of the ethnic studies curriculum that we've seen developed at the grassroots level through student and educator activism and engagement, and then pushed up to district and state level policy in places like California and Oregon. The research evidence that supports these forms of teaching is powerful and convincing. For instance, Tom D. and Emily Penner's research on the impact of ethnic studies courses in San Francisco Unified on student outcomes at three different high schools found that an assignment to an ethnic studies course increased ninth grade attendance by 21 percentage points, GPA by 1.4 grade points, and credits earned by 23. Overall, Dee and Penner write, the largest gains were found among boys and Hispanic students in the subjects of math and science. These surprisingly large effects suggest that culturally relevant pedagogy, when implemented in a high fidelity context, can provide effective support to at-risk students, they write. Similar, similarly, in 2012, um, a study found that while 48% of Tucson's Mexican-American students were dropping out of high school, 100% of students who enrolled in the ethnic studies classes in Tucson High graduated, and 85% went on to college. This is an approach that works. But teachers cannot provide this curriculum if the pressure placed on them by assessment policies, including teacher evaluation systems, are simply rewarding teaching to the test. Thus privileging the knowledge of, of those tests and nothing else. These kinds of pressures result in curricula that include very little science, virtually no social studies or history, and very little in the way of performing arts or cultural expression. And the narrowing of curricula clearly also contributes to the new Jim Crow of education. In his book, The Evolution of Deficit Thinking, Richard Valencia traces the deficit framing of students of color, those who have been minoritized for decades in our educational system especially in our curriculum, back to the days of colonialism. He writes, the single more important question in any meaningful discussion of curriculum is, what constitutes important knowledge? This is the debate that education has not had. Decisions are being made using a top-down approach that students must be taught this or that. These decisions are surrounded by inflated rhetoric and are transformed into standards and tests. When a multiracial, multi-ethnic, and multicultural society requires students to learn and be tested on certain things and not others without broad-based input or debate, the content and the test questions will align more closely with some students' experiences than others. And what happens when some students fail to meet these top-down standards? They experience the third pillar of the new Jim Crow of education, punishment for low test scores. It's clear from the research that discrete and incomplete measures of intelligence and ability, namely what is included on one or two high-stakes tests, lead to a narrow measures of good and bad students that feed into educator, educators' perceptions of discipline and punishment. When there is only one test-driven way to be smart, narrow metrics for behavior are similarly applied. Rigid measures of who is smart translate into rigid measures rigid measures of who is deviant. Gloria Ladson Billings and William Tate note that when students are rewarded only for conformity to perform white norms or sanctioned for cultural practices, dress, speech patterns, unauthorized conceptions of knowledge, 
white property is being rendered alienable. These perceptions of appropriate cultural practices and knowledge are reified in the ways we measure ability and intelligence almost exclusively through standardized tests. Not surprisingly, the centering of white cultural norms leads to racial disparities and suspensions. In 2016, federal data show that black students were four times as, like, as likely as white students to be suspended. And that being suspended in 10th grade led to more than 67,000 students dropping out of high school. Increasingly, researchers have found a direct link between standardized test scores and how students are punished. In fact, this has become a central component of market-based school choice, particularly within big cities where charter schools are no, com no excuses and compete with public schools for students and the funding that follows them. In our research on, on public schools in New York City that are struggling to compete with charter schools who control their admissions to screen for the highest achieving students, we hear many stories of students with higher test scores being siphoned off by charter schools, which are simultaneously pushing out lower scoring, stu lower scoring students by, by a persistent, persistent punishment. According to one principal whose public school receives what she calls a constant, quote, drip, drip, drip of students who've been in charter schools that teach to the test and enforce strict discipline codes. Charter school refugee students, as she calls them, have been told that they have not been meeting expectations, so they and their parents have developed hostile relationships with school, and they return to the public school angry. She noted that these students are selectively punished and pushed out based on test scores, and they return to the public schools after the enrollment data are collected and per-pupil funding is allocated. Another wave returns shortly before the, test, the, state test state, the state tests are given. As the principal quoted above notes, quote, we get a surge right before each state test, and so when we get the results for a child that should have been attached to their outcomes, we and so, and so then we get the results for a child who should have been attached to their outcomes at the charter school. To give you just an example of this, I want to show you a short clip that I'm sure many of you are familiar with from a charter school in New York City. So count it again, making sure you're counting correctly. In this video, Success Academy teacher Charlotte Dial's frustration is clear. Go to the calm down chair and sit. She angrily tears up a first grade student's work. There's nothing that infuriates me more than when you don't do what's on your paper. The video was taken by an assistant teacher in 2014 and published by the New York Times. This sort of teacher frustration with students with low test scores is reverberated throughout the system, but most, most, most often found in high stakes charter schools with no excuses. And this leads to the fourth and arguably the most important pillar of the new Jim Crow of education, test score gap to justify segregation. Noster and now write that when a single high stakes test is used to define which schools are good and bad, which students will succeed or fail, they function along with our current system of school choice as mechanisms used for racial coding that facilitates segregation and compounds the inequalities found in schools. This racial hier hierarchy becomes so ingrained that even when schools enrolling black, mostly black and Latinx students have high test scores, we still see them as bad schools. In fact, in a study my colleague at TC, Doug Reddy, and I conducted with a team of doctoral students on Long Island, we found that the race of the students in a school system affected the property values of otherwise identical houses in districts with similar test scores by as much as $50,000. In other words, the perception of good schools that is too often about the perception of race, even when black and Latinx students perform well on, on test norm for white students. These racialized perceptions affect school choices, home buying patterns, and even the redrawing of school district boundaries. In our research, we refer to these racialized perceptions as the sociology of reputation. Since 2000, nearly 50 predominantly white communities in the US have su successfully seceded from an existing countywide school system 
that is more racially and ethnically diverse than the new small school district they are creating. This proactive secessionist movement is rationalized by white advocates for separate and unequal schools based on the low quality of the schools they left behind. Schools enrolling predominantly students of color, schools with lower test scores, schools most schools most, like to teach, most likely to teach to the test to improve those scores, and schools with strict discipline and harsh punishment. And so we've seen that the new Jim Crow of education begins with a colonial mindset and ends with punishment and exclusion. These tangible forms of intangibility are supported by understandings of whose knowledge and culture and history matters. In the end, what has been produced is an educational system that denies the research and professional knowledge of our field, is psychologically and pedagogically damaging to all students, even those with high test scores, and fails to produce the critical thinkers or engaged members of society that we need to sustain our democracy. This is a system that hurts everyone. Guineer writes that the psychology of segregation does not just damage black people noting that it convinced working class whites that their interests lay in white solidarity rather than collective cross-racial mobilization around economic interests. Guineer then goes on to quote W.E.B. Du Bois, who referred to the racialized hierarchy as the public and psychological wage paid to white workers who came to depend on their status and privileges as whites to compensate for low pay and harsh working conditions. Parallel to Du Bois' 1935 insights, the U.S. remains divided racially, and thus we need to break barriers to build cross-racial mobilization that would dismantle not only the new Jim Crow of education, but also the inconvenient truth. If we view the present through Du Bois' lens, we can, we can better understand recent elections in the U.S., the support for building walls, and support for separating children from their parents much like the residential schools for indigenous students in the US and Canada. We can better understand a tax bill that gives more money to corporations and the wealthy while leaving thousands of public school districts to flounder. The public and psychological wage of continuing to center white privilege rather than improving the lives of those on the bottom and the income gap is high. But as I noted earlier, the field of education has both a colonizing and emancipatory potential. Education can be a tool for reconciliation. We can transform students and society, but only if we are willing to deeply understand the roots of the oppressive structures and policies. We need to reimagine education and how it is measured. We need to reexamine what and who is defined as deviant and excluded. We need to connect the research to the practice. And we also need to raise awareness among the public of what we know from the research and evidence, from parental intuition and common sense about the harms of too much testing, about the harms of narrow ways of measuring schools and students that lead to anxiety about the scarcity of good schools, about the zero-sum game of education and housing choice that frames parenting as the survival of the fittest and frames our society as a winner takes all. We can change our accountability system as Massachusetts is working on through the Massachusetts Consortium for Innovative Education Assessment. This consortium develops partnerships with public schools and their local teachers unions, joined together to create a fair and effective accountability system that's guided by a set of principles and offers a more dynamic picture of student learning, school quality, than a single standardized test. We can advocate for models and examples of good schools and best practices that embrace racial literacy and culturally relevant and ethnic studies curriculum and sustaining practices for working on school discipline through restorative justice practices and positive behavioral interventions and supports. We can, ex we can insist that educators see all through students through a lens of assets and not deficits that values the knowledge of families and communities. We can talk about how family separation and cultural genocide are reprehensible, and we can provide professional development to reimagine education for a racially just society, as my colleagues and I at Teachers College do with the help of our mentors each, sun, each summer. 
We center this institute around helping educators become more racially literate and able to teach in a culturally relevant way that fosters sustaining leadership in schools. We do this each summer at TC to move past simple understandings of racial integration to a recognition and critique of a racial hierarchy that, blames, that blatantly values whiteness and what are considered to be white European and colonial ways of knowing and being. As an example of this work, I want to show you a short clip of what educators learn at Teachers College in the summer. Now that I've had a couple of days to talk and think with my colleagues, I'm kind of thinking about the reimagination of the self and who you are in this system. I argue that before we can get to racial literacy, there has to be an understanding of history is how it's impacted all of our lives. You have to be willing to see yourself in a way that perhaps you have never seen yourself. It was really powerful to me to hear how I can be a part of this conversation um, and some of my role in the work of anti-racist behavior in, in the school building. When she looked at us, she didn't see region scores. She looked at us as STEM leaders. I believe that if an educator is standing in front of the classroom and talking about white privilege, it can create an honest environment. It's just, it's really amazing to be able to have these kinds of conversations with people from all over, uh, really, and just be amongst like-minded like people, it feeds you. This is the time to do the work. And you have amazing people at your side. Interrogate your motivation. Articulate your vision. And work with us together as we seek to reimagine education for a better world. So we hope that you can join us this July in this hopeful space. Report, reports are that the lost rivers of Toronto, those beneath the ground on which we stand, are overflowing and bubbling to the street level, causing structural flaws and plumbing problems to Toronto's modern grid of paved roads and vertical structures. Perhaps paving over the rivers was not such a good idea. Perhaps the colonists should have considered the power of rivers and humans' relationship to them. Perhaps they should have listened to indigenous ways of knowing and being. Rivers, rivers like the cultures and knowledge of those who've been minoritized and marginalized in our educational system, those who've been punished and excluded. These rivers are strong and resilient. I've known rivers, wrote Langston Hughes, the rivers below Toronto are not lost at all. They flow in the veins of educators and researchers who see children as far more than a standardized test score and who recognize the inconvenient truth of the new Jim Crow and express themselves in multimodal ways to end the racial hierarchy that rationalized colonialism, residential schools for indigenous students, and an educational system that perpetuates segregation again and again. Thank you. Thank you. And now, it is my great pleasure to present the film debut of Children Left Behind, Time to Reimagine Education. The research behind the film and the film itself have been funded by the Spencer and Hewlett Foundations, and we are all extremely grateful for the support. This is a pilot film that is based on the research I discussed in this address and provides a model for researchers working closely with filmmakers to convey evidence through, multi, through other, another modality. This is our research team on the left and the filmmakers on the right. We want to thank the, the students who've worked so hard to bring the research together with the film and the filmmakers. 
Lisa Benz, an amazing, amazing producer. So this is a production of Firelight Media and the TC research team. So we would like your feedback at the end, because it's a pilot, we hope to expand it to go to the film festival circuit and to be on PBS. So please email us at reimagining or Twitter, tweet, tweet us at reimagine for the feedback that you have on the film. Thank you. The purpose of education is to cultivate the very best of uh, humanity. To create students who become citizens. To help all students be somewhere in life. Be successful in life and have a bright future. To help me as a person grow, have experience in different career paths and find what I love. I think just about every president in modern times has had some concern with education, has tried to leave his mark, and has failed. Today, an estimated four out of every ten students in the fifth grade will never finish high school. Every child must have the best education that this nation can provide. Today, more than one-tenth of our 17-year-olds are functionally illiterate. You know, a huge percentage of children in poverty can't read at grade level. We don't have to accept an America where we do nothing about six million students who are reading below their grade level. We are struggling with a very difficult and long-standing problem in this country through the school system. We've been doing this for a long time. Education has always been built to sort of separate individuals and to support certain groups of people over other groups of people. So it was never designed to be for equality. It was designed in, in a lot of ways to sort of support the ruling class. Clearly, American education was not structured to be equal because when America started to actually create schools, they were first for all males, and then women were allowed, but it was legally impossible for blacks um, Latinos, those few that were here in early America, Native Americans, to even be a part of the educational system. If you looked at the curriculum of the time, at the way that schools were structured, it was primarily an instrument for social control and socialization and assimilation into what it meant, again, to be an American, which at the time was very consciously defined as what it means to be white, really. General Pratt was probably understood as one of the central figures in the development of the Indian boarding school system, which was about removing Indian children from their families, cutting hair, changing their names, forbidding them to speak their language. So then one of the maxims became, kill the Indian, save the man. The next hundred years really were about struggles by excluded groups to find some way to gain purchase in this system. Mainly as a result of the civil rights movement, the response from the federal government in the 1960s was to increase efforts really to compensate for centuries of neglect and racism that excluded many, 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 many students from what was considered to be an adequate education. It's just been 50 years since Brown versus Board of Education when it was actually a law that people of color had to have the same kinds of educational experiences as whites in this country. We haven't legally achieved it, nor have we just in practice achieved it. And this system was premised on segregation. It was premised on ensuring that black students particularly, but students of color were not given equitable access to opportunities. So I feel like that legacy shaped the construction of our, our, our kind of initial public education and that, that history is woven into the fabric of the modern education system. First run, education.
as the civil rights movement waned, so did federal commitment to integration and equity. And the education policy that followed was absolutely a backlash against what was considered by many people to be too much equity. I would put the beginning of the current wave of reforms back in 1983 with A Nation at Risk, which uh, brought out a whole bunch of indicators, mostly test-based, to argue that American education was in a state of crisis. You found that our educational system is in the grip of a crisis caused by low standards, lack of purpose, ineffective use of resources, and a failure to challenge students to push performance to the boundaries of individual ability, and that is to strive for excellence. We had basically this fact that our country, compared to other countries, didn't have these standards of education, so there was a standard movement and this belief that once all of our schools should be operating on the same systems and the same expectations. And that led to the testing movement, which led to No Child Left Behind. It's time to come together to get it done so that we can truthfully say in America, no child will be left behind. You'd think on the surface it sounds very commonsensical. Say, well, we're going to measure what kids should learn. We'll give people punishments and rewards based on that. They'll do more of, the, of what they need to do to get kids to learn more. But that's, I think, shows a fundamental misunderstanding of both testing and teaching. And, we're going to talk about and what that has led to over the last, what, 30-some years is a series of steps in which we keep adding pressure, adding tests and adding the pressure associated with tests to the point where it's now become the cornerstone of daily life in schools. I don't want you to worry, class. These tests will have no effect on your grades. They merely determine your future social status and financial success. Stressful. Stressful. Stressed. Probably the best word, because it just incorporates the amount of, like, fear and, like, worry that I have during a test. They give you this idea that you have to reach this expectation or you aren't smart. Kids my age should not be this stressed. And the fact that we have like a big test where everyone has to meet like these high expectations or fail this class, like that is not okay. Then the next step was actually the Obama administration saying, never mind punishing schools and we're gonna reward and punish individual teachers, which ratcheted the pressure up even further. Ready, begin. The stakes were that you were ranked as a school on a number of criteria, but the main criteria was the tests. And so teachers were part of their evaluations with their children's test scores. As a teacher, that pressure comes down to you. Whether you intend to or not, you automatically put that on children. The impact on teachers has been equally severe. Teachers are less satisfied with the profession than they have been previously. And so what we're really seeing is that the nature of education is being changed by policies that were initially intended to strengthen education and are in fact in many cases having the opposite effect. More teaching! It's not just another protest over the state standardized Common Core exams. The principal of PS321 in Park Slope actually called for this gathering and is backing up these angry and frustrated parents and teachers. What we're doing is we're taking our schools that are serving our most vulnerable kids and instead of saying, wow, these are the places where we need to really invest and make sure that we do everything to support these kids, we are instead perversely punishing them as if the school is somehow the problem. About two years ago, I was asked to actually stop teaching the way I was teaching because I wasn't teaching standardized testing. I felt like my professionalism and my career was in question, and I know I'm a good teacher. I know that my kids make gains and they enjoy my classroom, but to be told that just because they didn't have a test score, that's what I was being evaluated on, I thought that was awful. I felt awful. The standard I test tell us who has achieved, who has not achieved. They don't tell us much about why they did not achieve, and almost nothing about how you can put them on a different uh, course toward achievement.
We started a consortium. It's called the Massachusetts Consortium for Innovative Education Assessment. And it, it really was just a response to a measurement and accountability system that doesn't capture all of the things that we care about in schools. Let's talk about that first article that was called A Problem. Our goal was let's measure school quality more holistically, more fairly, and let's measure student learning in the same manner. We rely on what we call quality performance assessments, looking at actual pieces of student work that are teacher created in terms of the task and then classroom embedded in terms of the context. You can talk about like whatever you want to talk about, no matter how like broad the idea is. And I feel like it's a lot better because you're learning what you want to learn and at the same time you're also teaching the teacher something new. Oh, I see you're shaking your head. Do you want to explain? The people Our goal is to create the next measurement and accountability system for Massachusetts and to have that be a model for other states. If we can demonstrate to people that there is a fairer, saner way of measuring school quality, the demand will ultimately lead to policy change. We can't make these schools in this country safe. If children are not free of fear when they come to school, they are not going to learn very well. Gun Free Schools Act of 1994 was a specific um, policy that had a pretty profound impact on everything that we see in schools now, what we call the zero tolerance era. Zero tolerance. Zero tolerance. Zero tolerance for guns and drugs in schools. To be in a place where you're walking through metal detectors, you have police up front. It's a sadistic formula for what it means to go to school. And those places are most likely to be in the blackest, poorest, and most immigrant neighborhoods. Shame on us. This violent arrest in a high school classroom is causing national outrage today. The most recent national data was released um, for the year 2015 and 2016. Out-of-school suspension rates have gone down across the nation. Racial disparities are absolutely appalling in this area. In that year alone, there was 11 million days of lost instruction due to school suspension. 45% of those lost days were taken from African-American kids in particular. Uh, there's one school just I work with where the expulsion rate was 11 to 1. So a black child was 11 times more likely to be expelled than a white child. In no universe is a black child 11 times more disruptive than a white child. Standardized testing doesn't seem to many people to have a direct link to discipline, but many schools have found that they can increase their standardized test scores by having strict behavioral codes. You can pull, quote unquote, uh, problematic kids out of the classroom. You hear about schools really pushing out kids with struggle to keep up their scores. So there's tremendous um, pressure and incentive, really, to kind of exclude and remove students who are struggling academically and behaviorally. There's actually a lot of things we can absolutely do. One, we can ensure that disciplinary policies are equitable and fair to everyone, and that teachers are trained on what the policies are and how to handle them um, uh, with particular students. Let's do a quick check-in. Just give me a one word about like how your week has been. There's also things like restorative practice, restorative justice. It's an important area of programming that's been around in many indigenous communities. The last time that we met, you guys had a conflict with each other. Found that if a, a student was referred to the discipline system, they participated in something called a restorative conference or restorative mediation. They were less likely later to return to the discipline system. Ever since I've encountered the mediation circle, I've learned how to control my anger and I just talk about it. One study showed that for every school suspension a student received, it increased their likelihood of dropping out by 20 percent. It also is associated, every single suspension, with lower achievement. I think the next layer of work is to understand more about, well, what does it mean to have a high-quality, racially just, fair, restorative conference?
The strongest link between standardized test scores and school segregation is related to the fact that we provide standardized test score information and pretend that it is information about school quality. What do you guys think? So many parents believe that the only way that their children can get ahead in life is by sending them to the quote unquote right school. But what is the right school? It's often a school that is characterized by high standardized test scores. Not only is that not necessarily a better school, but it's also more likely to be a whiter school and a more affluent school. People don't want their children to go to school with poor children. Um, and they especially don't want them to go to school with poor black children. Like that, in terms of how I hear people talk, is the worst. We're more segregated now in schools than we were in 1954. Uh, and what's sad is no one seemed to care. Um, and that's what's really unfortunate. The collective effort that took place in the 40s and 50s and 60s to actually bring attention to segregation, that experience uh, no longer exists. If you happen to look at just public schools around the country, what you tend to see is that most white children are being educated in predominantly white schools. And most children of color, like black and brown kids, are being educated in mostly ethnic minority schools. And at the same time, 80% of the teaching force happens to be white teachers are increasingly teaching black and brown kids without necessarily having grown up in racially or ethnically integrated communities themselves. And that has serious implications for our ability to educate students from different backgrounds. Part of it in the United States is coming to terms with our racial practices, uh, and we haven't done that. Uh, you know, we've, we'll say, well, slavery's over and Jim Crow is over, but we still have deeply uh, structured racial practices. We still segregate people by space, by education, by jobs. Uh, we still, in some ways, are fighting the Civil War. There's not enough people of color in positions of power to shape what books are read. There's not enough people of color to shape what counts as legitimate history that should be taught. There's not enough people of color shaping how discipline practices play out. Any aspect of schooling in the United States uh, that you can consider a name vastly underrepresents people of color's contribution knowledge and culture. And for me, those are incredible assets that not only students of color don't have access to, but white students and white people don't have access to it either. I approach my education knowing that I'm going to be learning a lot about white experience and about learning a lot about white history. Society makes it so to get good money, you need to have a college degree. But why would people of color be interested in learning from a system that doesn't represent them? You know, education should not be about marginalizing um, students. What's happening in this mirror image? Hiding their true so history their true is. Culture. We're starting to see examples of what the purpose of education is in programs such as ethnic studies, which what we're trying to do is to re really address the the humanity of the student. Ethnic studies opened my eyes as connected me in a personal level. It told me about, you know, my ancestral and my indigenous background. Everything that's kind of being tossed into nature, do you see killing culture? It's there, important there, because you have to know who you are. Like, we all learned Someone the Caucasian them. history, might as well learned ours as well. We can know what we did, you know, how we developed over history and how we are here today. And next studies talk about things like identification, white supremacy, police brutality. And that that comes with power or sometimes lack of power. The things that are happening to us are happening to around all parts of the world. It makes me, makes me wanna make a change in the world and make things better. Once they're able to make the connection that something that they're currently living or seeing or observing is connected to something systematic, they feel like experts. So, what's happening right here? so I think it gives them a, a profound sense of confidence because you are asking them to reflect on their lives. Rebellious thing you can do is get educated. Forget what they told you in school. Get educated. I ain't saying play by the rules. Get educated.
the more we begin to see black, brown, Latino, immigrants, gender nonconforming people's knowledge find its way into policies, into schools, into the curriculum, into what students read, into what students are learning, I just think that we're gonna have a society and a school system where students can actually achieve their best human potential. What's happening now in the United States is that the majority of children entering school, the majority of five-year-olds, are children of color. Uh, so if we don't educate them, obviously it's not fair for them. It's hard to have a good life, a meaningful life, uh, without an education. But the negative implications of this don't just affect, quote unquote, people of color, but affects our entire society. The truth is there isn't enough political will to kind of make these changes. We have so many brilliant people who are literally pumping out mountains of research and they're not being listened to. They are constantly coming up against walls that prevent them from doing what they know when their heart is right. With every day that passes that we don't have that political will, we are losing generations of people. Through our collective action, through the pressure we can exert on our leaders, we can begin challenging existing policy structures that don't make a lot of sense. We can begin building new policy structures that will actually accomplish the aims that we have for public education. I think we can make a lot of progress. We need to grow together, we need to learn together, but we need to share power and respect. And I don't think you can do that by just funding a broken system. I don't think that's possible. If we rethink what our schools are for and who they're for and what they're for, um, I think we can actually achieve something really powerful, maybe even in my lifetime. So we hope to interview all of you for the full-length film. So please do send us your feedback um, and input. We want to keep working with this project as an example of taking research and trying to um, spread the word to the larger audience about what we know in our field. And now it is my great honor to, to hand this introduction, to introduce you, sorry, to your 2019-20 AERA president, Vanessa Siddle Walker. I said this earlier today, but I like it so much I'm going to say it again. When I think of what makes someone a scholar, I think of Vanessa. Because I believe a scholar is someone who becomes so deeply engaged not only in conducting research, but someone who also lives within and is energized by the significance of her work. When I listen to Vanessa talk about her research, I know that it is not simply her work, it is her journey, her calling, and her fate. And we are so fortunate in this association to have her leading us for the next year. I want to, I want to introduce Vanessa, my colleague, my friend, my mentor. to give you this. It's a real gavel. It's a real gavel. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> Good afternoon to all of you. Uh, well, I guess it's closer to evening now. Amy is a quiet powerhouse. She doesn't talk loudly as I often talk. She doesn't talk expressively with her hands. And yet what she says is so extraordinarily powerful. She's a quiet powerhouse, quiet powerhouse. I want to commend Amy because of the extraordinary vision she has brought to us to have us think about what does it mean to confront truth when we live in a historic moment where truth is questioned. I'm grateful that she had us do it with the program 
because during our programming, we were forced to think about what do we actually know? If we take our knowledge across disciplinary boundaries, across our divisions and our SIGs, what do we know? Amy asked us to think about that, and I applaud her for that. Not only did she ask us to think about what we know, she asked us to also think about how we can use multimodal ways to communicate what we know. I love seeing that in her program, and I loved it even more watching it this evening. Both in her lecture, she is pushing us on the inconvenient truths, those ones that we would prefer to ignore. The truths about testing are truths that we need to hear, and I applaud her for doing that. And I love the multimodal ways she had us think about the truths around testing. So I applaud her vision and her courage in both of these areas, her courage to speak, these quiet, powerful truths, her courage to bring the students. I love the students. I used to be a high school English teacher. And so to see students up close, just, I just love it deep in my heart. I applaud her for bringing them and giving them the opportunity to creatively show us that truth and her courage in creating the film. When we were in San Diego, not San Diego, San Antonio, under Vivian Gadsden's presidency, Amy had just become president-elect, and I remember her telling me, I'm gonna make a film. <laughs> and I thought to myself, who makes a film? I, I don't even know how you start that. But in Amy's quiet and very powerful way, she has pulled this off, and I am so extraordinarily proud to see what she's done in so many ways and pushed us to think about all of these ideas. Um, Amy called me once late at night and she was talking about truth and injustice and how we need to understand the other. And I remember her saying, we should sing this little light of mine. I'm going to let it shine. And I said, Amy, it is my bedtime. I am not going to sing with you. We are not going to sing this little light of mine. And so she started off without me. Um, and I think we have to say that tonight, she let her light shine, and I hope you will join me in congratulating her again. So here we are. Amy has passed me a gavel. Never in my life have I owned a gavel. I will say that I am honored by the trust that you have put in me to give me the opportunity to even think about how to lead this association. Thank you for that. I've spent the last year actually doing just that. Where can we go from the ideas that she's pushed us to think about? And here's where I want us to go. If we know certain things, then it seems to me we ought to tell somebody. <laughs> That's not academic you know, language, but that just seems pretty straightforward. It seems to me that at an annual meeting, we would want to talk to people beyond ourselves. We do an extraordinary job pushing one another to become better researchers. We do that very well. And there are individuals among us who also push us to talk to different audiences. We've had wonderful presidents, VPs who have done that. But I'm asking us to think as an organized body of 25,000 members, what would it look like? What would be the power and the possibilities if educational researchers engaged in conversations with organizational stakeholders, people who are actually doing the work, who understand the problems, what would collaboration look like? I have, thank you, I have reasons for thinking we ought to do that, but I won't go through all those reasons tonight. I will let you know that you can expect the, the um, call for proposals in May and the thing will be out next week. Before I go, however, I want to recognize 
Um, there are actually six undergraduates who are here, the Horace Tate Scholars from Emory University. My guess is they are not in the room. They're probably scouting around looking for free food. Oh my gracious, a few of them are here. Okay, all right. <laughs> Uh, these Horace Tate scholars have actually gone through your research for the last 10 years at ARA programs. They can tell you better than anyone exactly what we've done and what we've not done. And I want to thank them for helping me think about the theme. I appreciate you young people. I'm looking forward to seeing what you will become. But I also want to thank the people who are going to implement this theme, Michelle Purdy, and Cheryl Croft are out there somewhere that I cannot see. Both have worked with me closely at Emory, one leading a research team and one leading um, an initiative that allowed us to work in public schools in the Atlanta area. Together, they will help me figure out how we stitch research and researchers with schools, communities, and problems. So I'm excited about the possibilities. I can't say that I'm thrilled about what it means to create an AERA program chair, a uh, program, especially after watching what Janelle and Jen and Amy have done so beautifully this year. But we all give that which we have and we give that which we have to the best of our ability with the hope that some of these problems that we see, that we know are wrong, we can figure out how to make a difference for another generation of children. So will you join me in San Francisco in 2020? It might be a little warmer, maybe. <laughs> Have a very good evening. Thank you all.